What I want to do today is we're going to go into some statistics about the industry. Um, we have some recent numbers, uh, mostly from uh, attending the AQHA convention, um, which was just last weekend, or the weekend before, and some other numbers uh, from last year uh, that were presented during the American Horse Council uh, from Jockey Club, a um, number of other organizations. Um, then we'll look at some of the uh, owner issues, some of the welfare issues that are out there, um, and then Dr. Lenz will go into some of the solutions that at least the industry is uh, trying to address. So here's just a brief glance um, looking at uh, some of the stress factors to the horse industry as a whole. Um, I'm sure some of these have gone down. Of course, gasoline uh, is doing a lot better. Um, hay costs are probably about the same at this point. Um, unemployment's down just a little bit, but probably fairly uh, consistent there. When we look at some of the breed numbers and uh, membership of those organizations, uh, of course you can see a trend here. Uh, the top line, the red line is quarter horse, which is always going to be the largest. Uh, the paint in second, which is the light blue. And then you've got uh, green for standard bread, and then Arabians uh, on the membership side. I don't, uh, and then purple. Uh, Arabians are the maroon, and then purple on the uh, breed transfer side. Uh, we don't have thoroughbred numbers, but um, they don't do a membership through the Jockey Club. Um, but I've got some thoroughbred numbers I'll share here in a minute. Um, these are some recent numbers from uh, American Quarter Horse Association. Um, the uh, good news is their transfers are finally seeing an uptick. And here's a look at the transfers throughout the industry. Uh, quarter Horse, of course, being the majority. Paint, second, and Standard Breads, then Arabians, Appaloosa, and Walking Horses. Looking at some of the comparisons, uh, you can see some of the decreases over the recent uh, time periods. Of course, quarter horse having a larger population, those numbers down uh, dramatically. Um, but you'll see in the next slides here that that trend is starting to reverse itself a, a, a little bit. Um, the change is only 2.65% uh, on the quarter horse uh, of course, the walking horse industry still continues to see a, a rapid decline um, in their membership of their association, and the miniatures uh, continues to have a strong decrease. And then here's a pie chart looking at uh, the breakdown of those industries in their, from a membership standpoint. Here's, a interest, here's some interesting uh, numbers to look at. Um, and again, these are quarter horse statistics. Um, racing stallions um, has, have continued to decrease, and this is all the way to 1990. Um, as Dr. Lenz and I were speaking this morning, uh, for the show stallions and the race stallions, you probably have mostly uh, business individuals that are involved uh, in those industries. And as things have, you know, continued to uh, decrease, they've probably made their decisions quicker than as you look at other activity stallions, probably trail riders and, you know, other uh, backyard owners, and those numbers have not decreased. Uh, they actually increased up until around, you know, the middle of the 2000s, and of course we know what happened then with the stock market dropping dramatically. Here's a look at horse registration trends. Um, and again, looking at those most recent numbers on the quarter horse side, where you do have an uptick um, compared to when the stock market started dropping. Uh, quarter horse in blue at the top, uh, pink are the paints, yellow are thoroughbred numbers we have in here. And then you've got standard breads and Arabians at the bottom in the maroon. 
And then again, some recent numbers uh, looking at AQHA registrations as presented in the earlier one uh, have been declining until this last year. So that's a good sign. Registration in the industry, again, looking at uh, most recent 14 to 13. Quarter horse is actually up 12%. Uh, paints are down 13%. Tennessee walkers down almost uh, 32%. Miniatures down, uh, but the Arabians are up and Pasifinos are up. So here's just a, and Saddlebred's down still quite significantly as well, uh, down 19%. And then just to look pie chart wise, registrations uh, in the industry, of course, quarter horse paints, thoroughbreds included here, uh, still predominant and standard breads. Looking at uh, foal registrations, um, the this is an interesting chart because it goes back to 1964 and brings up estimates uh, through the end of year, um, but you can see them leveling out, and again this is just for quarter horse uh, foal registrations. Um, but again, in the 80s you had the drop in the market and you also had the tax laws changes, tax law changes, and then again an increase up until uh, the stock market changed again uh, in the middle of 2000. Here's a uh, thoroughbred foal crop numbers, eight, 1986 and then 2012 and you see a big dramatic decrease there. And then here's a look um, from 2004 through 2014. Uh, they continue to decrease. But I think in recent discussions with the Jockey Club, they anticipate probably a leveling off. Um, and you'll see some uh, information. We'll talk about some of the sales, which I think will affect some of that leveling off in the future as well. Um, looking at uh, American Horse Council Breed Roundtable, just a quick glance, uh, U.S. Equestrian Federation, their membership is up uh, a small amount, and their show entries are up about 20%, so that's a good sign. Arabians, again, show numbers are up, as well as embryo transfers and exports. The Therapeutic Riding Association uh, has seen a 7% increase in their growth, and then NCHA, PRCA, and of course Quarter Horse, all of their events, purses, and entries are seeing increases uh, of recent years. This is just a quick glance looking at uh, one of the sales from last year, but that trend over the last, uh, last year has continued even into this year. I know the Ocala breeding sale, the two-year-old sale just completed, and their numbers were up. Um, I think anecdotally what I hear uh, from individuals at the sales are that those horses that are good horses are seeing better prices and those horses that uh, are not so good are also seeing better prices. So both buyers and sellers are feeling a little more comfortable um, about, about the industry. And here's a quick look at uh, some of those sale prices for thoroughbreds. Uh, I don't have the 14 numbers in yet, but you'll see uh, numbers have gone up since uh, 2010. Um, but again, some but they're having uh, less less animals that are actually going through the ring. Looking at horse population again, most recent. Uh, Population study, uh, economic impact study, was done in 2005 by the American Horse Council. Um, so, you know, we just have to find the funds uh, in the future to, to get another one of those. While this number says 9.2 million, I think we estimate that number now to be around 6.6, 6, 7 million, if I'm uh, close in that estimate. Um, again, as a splintered industry, it's difficult and you'll see in this presentation, we're gathering information from a variety of sources. Um, so, you know, I know when I talk to a number of our educational partners at AAP, 
they're always looking for this population number when they go to marketing uh, and their managers to talk about you know things that they need to do and a number of them said those old numbers from 2005 are actually kind of damaging uh, their ability to, to talk to the industry. Um, so that may be something that we as an industry really need to look at um, updating in the future. Tom, do you have a question? You know, if you take that 9.2 million and a little over 3% of the horses in this country die every year, either shipped or processing plants or euthanized or die naturally, you can, and then if you look at the breeding numbers, you can, Don Treadway and I one day sit down and calculated that, and it's about six, seven. Okay. If you pick that 3% death loss from 9.2 million and what the breeding spent, it comes out about what you said. Using the major breed organizations? Yeah. Okay. That's good. And then looking at uh, state populations, I know many of you are here from some of those states. Um, hopefully we're close on some of these numbers here. But I don't think these numbers have changed dramatically. Um, I don't see Illinois in here. I always thought they had a larger pop horse population. Looking at owner demographics, uh, estimate about 1.8 million horse owners, uh, generally speaking, are female, 45 plus in age, income of 55,000 plus, full-time employed and married. And these numbers are coming from uh, the Bracky Equine Marketing Mega Study in 2014. Uh, demographics, 85% recreational riders, 30% participate in competitive events, and you see the rest of the numbers here, with uh, racehorse ownership being the smallest at 2%. 24% believe horse economy is improving. 24% believe the other direction, that the economy is getting worse. 40% Western style riding, mostly uh, competitive events, including barrel racing, pleasure and trail, and 16% are English driven. Looking at the current culture and some of the attitudes, of course, as we call them, the horse crazy boomers are aging. Uh, new generations have multiple interests. Horse world can seem arrogant to some, especially non-horse owners and increased public concern with horse welfare. And we'll talk more about that coming up. Of course, there's a variety of industry uh, issues that are out there, uh, welfare being one of them, a variety of uh, federal and state legislation, uh, legislative efforts occurring, uh, unacceptable training techniques, processing of horses for meat, merging diseases, and number one, declining horse ownership. When we look at some of the issues, equine welfare being one of those, some of those include unwanted horses, racing, wild horses, show horse ethics, Tennessee walking, soaring, and horse slaughter. So that's what I'd like to get into next. Um, as we have here, the public concern for horse welfare is at an all-time high, while the public's knowledge of what constitutes good welfare is at an all-time low. Dr. Lenz likes this and I think it sums up things well, especially for those attending this meeting. Animal welfare is becoming, is fast becoming the major challenge of the veterinary profession for this industry. This is provided by Dr. Bernie Osborne, Dean Emeritus, University of California, Davis. From Todd Allen, the greatest threat to animal agriculture is a misinformed consumer, the public. Here's some information from the Center for Food Integrity Survey. Uh, most credible source of information on farm animal care, according to consumers, it is, is HSUS. Next is veterinarians at 12%, along with PETA at 12%, and farm and ranchers at 6%. Survey of fifth graders, this is from 2009 USA Today survey. 
What are the most important issues in the world? Welfare of animals, protecting the environment, and caring for people. So we're smart people. How difficult can making recommendations on equal and welfare really be? And then, of course, racing. Um, AP and a number of organizations continue to address the medication issues that are out there. Um, there are so many regulatory agencies out there, I can't even name them all. Um, but again, the focus being to try and improve the welfare of these horses. Um, but yet, when you have accidents that occur, they become very, very public and feed into uh, the mindset of those individuals that uh, did not grow up with animals in, in sporting events. So we look at animal use and care decisions and how do we get to such a different place? Why the divergence on what constitutes good welfare? Our views on animal welfare are conditioned by our personal knowledge base and life experiences. As you can see the photo in above, physically you can see this animal uh, does not have good welfare. But yet some people will think the bottom one has good welfare when in fact it does not. On water horse, we look at this issue specifically. Horses as livestock versus companion animal. We're in a room with uh, a number of people in the ag industry, so I'm not preach. I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit, but um, you all know the pitfalls that we're up against, or the, the challenges we're up against um, in trying to uh, combat horses as livestock. Um, and we know there are reasons um, that we need to have horses continually listed as livestock. When we look at this issue, it's also complicated by urbanization, and this is probably the underlying issue for a lot of things in our culture. You look at uh, the U.S. population, it of course continues to grow, but the number of, pop of farms that are out there, that number continues to decrease. Um, this is an interesting uh, note here from the Daily Journal. Um, to all you hunters who kill animals for food, shame on you. You ought to go to the store and buy meat that was made there where no animals were harmed. And again, you guys have heard that many times in many different formats. Um, and I know one of your earlier presenters about media um, emphasized a good bit of that as well. Um, of course, it's also complicated by the processing of horses for human consumption. And it's complicated by aggressive campaigns by animal activist groups uh, for all of these issues. What happens to those unwanted horses? It's complicated by America's public love of the horse, whether it be in books, TV, or other media, or their experiences that maybe they had um, or are not having. When we look at animal-related businesses, welfare is important and they care for the animals, but there's always concern, and as an industry, you're, we're always gonna have the concern for production efficiencies, costs, competitive pressures, return on investment, and habituation. We may view animals as instruments for, or there is a view of animals as instruments for human use often viewed as cold and uncaring by the public. From the, from the activist standpoint, uh, many are not familiar with animal industries and animal care practices. Most are driven by a genuine desire to make sure animals are used appropriately, and they use celebrities and emotion to carry them, their message. But their organizations need to survive, so they also use these messages to raise money. From a public official standpoint, they come from all walks of life and experiences. Most are not familiar with animal industries and animal care, but they need to be reelected and appointed. 
So there's tremendous potential influence from the stakeholder. And those stakeholders don't come from rural areas for the most part. Urbanization. Animals move from utility to companions. Pet parents versus owners. Our modern animal rights activists. Vision of animal welfare similar to their own personal welfare. And they want a voice and protect the animals, but they're not sure what that means. One person can drive by a field and see a horse and think it looks uh, like it's in danger, but another person will drive by and that horse looks normally healthy and most likely cases probably is. So what resonates with the public? Dr. Lenz uh, was shopping one day and found this carton of cage-free eggs. And of course, there's a lot more public perception out there. You see more television ads. But when you look at this, what does resonate with the public now? So, small Amish Mennonite family farms. It's on the packaging. Eggs gathered by hand, allowed to roam freely, and fed a vegetarian diet. So they cost $4 a dozen. Right. So while organic and family friendly and hand gathered makes sense and is a sellable commodity, as Dr. Lenz just mentioned, it does cost more. So looking at unwanted horses, horses which are no longer wanted by their current owner because they are old, injured, sick, unmanageable or failed to meet their owner's expectations. And I think that last one probably resonates higher in many of the other in many of our discipline industries. So what are the contributing factors? Downturn economy, closing of the processing facilities, high cost of euthanasia and carcass disposal, and indiscriminate breeding. Demographics for the unwanted horse are generally old, lame, some can be dangerous, some are unadoptable, such as Mustangs to a degree, or they fail to meet the owner's expectations. They're not pretty, they're not athletic, they're unmarketable, wrong color, or they cost too much. Normal healthy horses and various ages and various breeds. Most likely to be sold, show or competition horses, failed to meet expectations, quarter horse paint, thoroughbreds, three to 10 years of age, 45% mares, 48% geldings. Most likely to be donated, race horses, failed to meet expectations, thoroughbred quarter horse, six to 20 years of age, 33% mares, 63% geldings. Most likely to be euthanized, Recreational riding horses, older horses, or those that are terminally ill or injured, quarter horse, thoroughbred Arabians, 10 to 21 plus years, 55% gelding, 42% mares. And the number of one one horses. So these are recent numbers, uh, year in last, uh, last year, 2014, 44,721 exported to Canada for processing and 105,339 exported to Mexico for a total of 150,000 horses sent to uh, processing locations. Uh, there's others, of course, Native American herds ne neglected, abandoned, and abused. Here's a look from, to, from uh, 1990 to 2011 of horses that have been uh, processed. And you've got listed here, U.S., of course, uh, until 2007 when the plants closed. In red, green Me is Mexico, blue is Canada, and then a few years uh, in Japan. And then here's some more recent numbers <clears throat> to look at. You've got numbers from 2010 for both Canada and shipped to Canada and Mexico. And you'll see those numbers continue to remain uh, over 100,000 plus. Uh, solutions for unwanted horses, reopening the processing plants in the U.S., 
educate owners to breed, purchase, and own responsibility responsibly, increase ability of private and rescue retirement facilities to care for unwanted horses, increase options and resources to euthanize and to dispose of these horses. Here's just a brief look at the uh, processing uh, plants, the ones that were closed in 2007. Uh, we're in Illinois, I'm sorry, in uh, Iowa, correct? Oh, it was Illinois, I'm looking at the dot there. Um, that's what I thought. And then the two in Texas. Then we look at uh, transportation of these horses. Um, 1996 Farm Bill gave USDA the responsibility for regulating commercial transportation of horses to slaughter and ensures each horse is fit for travel. Horses provided food, water, and rest to loading of the vehicles. Each horse has enough floor space to avoid injury or discomfort. Stallions or aggressive horses are completely segregated and transport documents certify the date, time, place, the equines are loaded on the conveyance. A couple studies were completed in uh, 1999, uh, Temple Grandin study. I won't go into all the details of those studies, but we continue to use that information as well as looking at other uh, information that will be able to be provided for those that are caring for horses that will be transported on double deck facilities or conveyances. In 2011, uh, the industry and others worked with the Government Accountability Office they completed their study at the direction of Congress and their findings on actions needed to address unintended consequences from the cessation of domestic slaughter. And their findings included closing plants, reduced price to lower to medium price horses by 8 to 21 percent. Uh, there was no effect on higher price horses. There was an economic downturn that reduced prices on all horses by four to five percent. Recommended actions, uh, just a few of them, uh, return regulation and inspection of horses for slaughter in the U.S. and per or permanently and completely outlaw the use of horses for food animals. And of course neither of those have occurred. Um, looking at some federal legislation in 1996, they amended and again amended in 2006, they phased out double deck trailers for transport for slaughter horses um, and expanded this in 2011. In 2013, uh, and many years prior to that, or many Congresses prior to that, um, the Safeguard American Foods Export Act, the SAFE Act basically, which uh, is an act to ban processing or the transportation of processing, um, that bill has never has never passed Congress and as far as I know has not been reintroduced uh, in this new Congress as of yet. From a horse transportation safety act standpoint, this bill was just reintroduced um, on the House side but not on the Senate side and this was introduced uh, to prohibit the transport of all horses in vehicles that contain two or more levels. And then of course, uh, as in past Congresses, uh, the Farm Appropriations Bill did restrict processing plants, USDA inspection, so basically that continues to hold the processing plants um, at bay. So that's about all we had there. Moving on, we're gonna touch on uh, racing a little bit. Um, no, we have uh, issues uh, in racing. Um, of course, in the 70s, racing was very, very popular as in years uh, before. But then we had uh, the growth of television, which uh, the breakdown of Champion Philly in 1975, the horse ruffian, uh, made it very, very difficult and made it very public um, regarding the welfare of racehorses. Then again in 1990, 2006, 2008, 
We had three more breakdowns. Um, go for one, eight bells in the Oaks in uh, 2008. And then, of course, Barbaro, who uh, did not die on the track but was succumbed to uh, laminitis later. From a culture standpoint, uh, it's reduced popularity. We got lower number of starts, number of races, the handle, the, the, what the people bet is down, and of course attendance is down. And a huge factor, of course, is the aging fan base. There's public concern about medications, breakdowns, questions about drugs in all sports. And of course you see that out there. Uh, medication in general, the public believes Drugs are cheating, drugs are performance enhancing, and they end up causing breakdowns. The AP as a veterinary association continues to work with various agencies and those within the industry. Um, one of the things that we have done and continue to work on are clinical guidelines for veterinarians practicing in the racehorse environment. Uh, we've com we completed those and continue to review those and make updates as needed. Um, but of course, the focus being putting the horse first. We have these done for standard breads, for thoroughbreds, and qu and quarter horses. The AP supports uniform medication rules, as do I think most everybody in in the uh, industry. Uh, we of course want these based on science. Uniform testing procedures, and we work with the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium uh, and addressing those their efforts to get the state regulatory bodies on board. Um, it's continued trial effort because most state uh, authorities are regulated by those state racing commissions. Um, of course, there's also concerns from a lab standpoint, and RMTC has continued to work to certify labs and make sure that those uh, tests are being conducted appropriately. Um, we want uniform penalties. We want strict punishment for repeat offenses and prohibited substances. The AP does support allowing Lasix on race day. We do feel it is a therapeutic medication for pulmonary, for EIPH. Um, as mentioned, we continue to work with industry partners, whether it's the Racing Commissioners International, Jockey Club, uh, the various state regulatory bodies, and I've already mentioned uh, RMTC. Challenges, of course, there's many trainers. There's some veterinarians that want permissive medication. Uh, there are 38 racing jurisdictions out there which make it a real challenge. Uh, and the public cannot differentiate between therapeutic medications and performance enhancing drugs. Some more of the challenges, uh, injuries are multifactorial. Science always weighs on, uh, science on ways to reduce them is limited at times and breakdowns will never be completely eliminated. Other initiatives, there's various task forces, uh, in New York, they looked at uh, racehorse health and safety at, at uh, Aqueduct, and they've got some new rules that have come out specifically in New York. Uh, California, they're looking at necropsies of all fatalities, and they've got a new track safety program. And then, of course, from a research standpoint, uh, number one is uh, Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation. They're working on a number of issues, not just uh, disease and other health issues, but also uh, racetrack injuries and uh, a number of universities are working on projects as well. Any questions on racing or anything? I've, I'm just ran moving on here. Um, moving on to uh, the BLM and the Wild Horse Program. Uh, most of you probably are aware of this program. 1971, Congress passed the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrow Act. Uh, the goal with four subsequent amendments afterwards uh, is to ensure the health, that, that healthy herds thrive on healthy rangelands. Program protects, manages, and controls the population of wild horses and burrows. And management includes 
reducing the wild herd numbers. Uh, the BLM and mission is twofold, healthy ranges and healthy horses, but of course it's not a simple task. Um, there are various herd management areas uh, that are out there and they're reviewed by the BLM. And there's various herd reduction strategies, including fertility management and gathers uh, for plan removals of these horses. Uh, the Wild Horse Program and Bureau Program began as an adoption program, but it has evolved into a welfare program. And you'll see in a minute some of these numbers. When you look at 16,000 feral horses and bureaus adopted in the pipeline, about 8,000 horses if adopted, and 33,000 unadoptable feral horses and bureaus in the BLM funded sanctuaries, cost about $45,000 lifetime to care per horse if not adopted, and 46 to 72 million are spent uh, on their budget overall each year to house these animals. 48,000 uh, are on the range today uh, with an estimated capacity of only about 26,000. Nearly half, about 20,000 reside in Nevada, 4,000 in California and Arizona, 3,500 in Wyoming and Utah, and some smaller numbers in Oregon, Montana, New Mexico, Idaho, and Colorado. 50,000 are on uh, non-BLM federal and state lands. These aren't protected by the Act. And the lands are managed by Fish and Wildlife, Park Service, Department of Defense, and Forest Service. So when we look at population control with some of the gathers and other population control measures, you can see these numbers have uh, dramatically increased and in the per, uh, they're uh, anticipated to continue uh, to dramatically increase. Um, population number, again, you'll see here in the uh, tens of thousands in uh, current years, uh, estimated by 2030 to be nearly a million horses. This is an interesting uh, chart here to look at. Historical, on-the-range, off-range, removal and adoption numbers. So when you look at the blue lines, that's the population of those that are on, uh, on the range. And when you look at the off-range, these are the locations where we're paying $500 a head to have them managed at other facilities. That's the uh, pink line. But yet when you look at the other numbers, uh, the animals removed and then the animals adopted, you can see those numbers going the other direction. So that's why we look at uh, we're in the welfare business, we're not in the adoption business for the BLM program anymore. Some of the older horses are trained, fewer of those are mature, and they go to prison programs. And then there, there's been a new program called the Extreme Mustang Makeover, uh, who our friend uh, Patty Colbert has managed and uh, continues to, uh, I think she continues to operate that. Um, it's managed by the Mustang Heritage Foundation, and they've sold over 2,000 horses uh, from the program since 2007. Um, I may need your help here a little. <laughs> you veterinarians, you know this better than me, but uh, from a fertility uh, standpoint, um, from what I understand, and Dr. Lynch, you may want to explain this further for those that don't, um, these are the activities that are currently taking place on on the range, is that correct? Right. So right now the issue is the animal activist group do not want permanent sterilization. And so the BLM is using uh, forcing zonopalusta vaccines to prevent pregnancy, prevents the sperm from impregnating the uh, oocyte. And so 
uh, there are two vaccines. One lasts about a year, and they can inject that, so they can use that in darts. They can dart horses uh, with that, lasts about a year. Uh, the other vaccine is a pellet that lasts around 22 to 24 months, and that has to be inserted under the skin. So they have to capture those horses. That, that vaccine costs about $250 a dose, and it costs about $1,500 to catch a horse, to catch a wild horse. So it costs nearly $2,000 a head. Um, the problem is they only gather, they never gather a herd more than every four years. And so they're not really, uh, they may control some of the mares for a little while, but not very long. And these horses are selected for fertility, not performance, naturally selected. So they're extremely fertile and almost every two-year-old mare will be pregnant. Uh, and so they tried this through the years. They only they only vaccinate maybe 2,400 horses a year max. So it has almost no effect. The other thing they've done is removed stallions from the range at a higher ratio than mares. But the average wild herd is five to seven mares for the stallion and 40% of the foals are bred by a satellite horse, by another stallion, not the not the herd stallion. So, we, and half the foals are stallions. So, removing the stallions has had no effect. Uh, and so, they've kind of thrown their hands up. I was involved with a couple of uh, National Academy of Science uh, committees where we were looking at how to manage these horses. And so. Uh, some of the research that's been funded uh, here just very recently looks at a vaccine that will last longer. But we've also got a Kennedy agreement from BLM to, uh, you know, when they capture these horses, as he said, it costs about $500 a head per horse. They pay ranchers in Kansas and Oklahoma. So they're spending $48 million a year just feeding horses in the wild. Those horses live to be 12 or 15 in sanctuaries, they live to be 25 or 30, just like our domestic horses. So some of the studies that we funded were uh, spay castration studies, and rather than vaccinate them, capture them and, and spay the mares and castrate the stallions and put them back in the range, rather than put them in sanctuaries. But BLM, is under a lot of pressure from the animal activist groups. They kind of caved to them pretty much, and they're not sure they can get that past them, but at least the BLM's willing to do that, which is a big shift for them. So that'd be interesting to see what happens. But for sure, the program doesn't work, and if they don't do something, there's going to be horses everywhere. Great. What? Starved, Starved to death. And the yeah. deer, the elk, and everything else. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I've been in some uh, meetings where you have the activists there in debate. And they think it's okay if they starve to death. Really? And they also think it's okay if one of them said, well, you know, there's two herds in, there in uh, California that mountain lions keep them at zero growth because the mountain lions have learned to kill foals. And so there's no reproductive uh, capability there. And this person said, well, I think about to capture those mountain lions and move them to the other herd so they can kill the foals. <laughs> and I said, well, mountain lions like to eat deer. And maybe if you move them somewhere where there are more deer, they wouldn't eat foals, they eat the deer. Right. But I mean, that kind of mindset, kind of hard to have. And that's a, okay, but it's not all right. Take more society. Because that's natural, natural. So it's kind of a hard issue, and it's kind of hard to have that debate. Captain Bolt has a lot. Can you imagine that reasoning? It's hard. I don't know what the world can do. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and the uh, the land management part has a big part of this as well. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, if they had their way, I think a lot of them there would be no deer, elk, or cattle, or sheep out there. Would just be horses. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lenz. So, 
He's already mentioned uh, the fertility control efforts here. Um, moving on, I want to talk briefly about the soaring of Tennessee walking horses, um, as well as uh, spotted saddle horses and racking horses. Um, brief history of the Big Lick, uh, as they like to call it. Um, in the 40s and 50s, uh, population surged in the south. And the Big Lick, uh, kind of like the alley-oop in a way, is what everybody wanted. Um, 50s and 60s, shortcuts developed because the horse, it's not a natural gait for these horses to lift their feet that high. So they started soaring using shoes, weights, pads, chains, and chemicals. What is soaring? Some of those shortcuts, application, insertion, or injection of any substance or material onto or into the limb and manipulation of that limb that causes pain, distress, inflammation, or lameness. It can be done with chemicals, pads, shoes, or other hardware, or in a combination of any of those. It can also be done with some uh, hoof shaping. Signs of soaring, standing with the feet closed, shifting weight to hind legs, irritated, scarred, or dark skin on the pasterns, resistant of hoof, Handling or pastern palpation, uh, lying down a lot, re reluctance to rise, difficulty walking, or praying mantis gait, as we like to call it. So, so what are some of the performance packages? Well, these include pads, or as we call stacks. Uh, you can see a picture of a stack there uh, in the back next to the uh, course below and above. Uh, bolts, heel springs, a fixed to the hoof, and the pads can be up to four inches at the heel, two inches at the toe. They're often weighted, and they're strapped on by uh, metal bands to, to the hoof. Um, currently, this is unregulated. From a chemical standpoint, irritants include caustic chemicals applied to the pastern and chains added to increase the pain. It exaggerates the gait, which is then rewarded in the show ring because of the culture of those individuals that are showing and, and that are judging. Uh, irritants include kerosene, diesel, mustard or cotton oil, hand cleaner, WD-40, the list goes on and on. Um, it's illegal, but unfortunately it's widespread. What are action devices? These are chains or rollers. They can be steel, aluminum, or wood. Uh, circle in front pasterns. They cause pain when very heavy or if skin is inflamed. Currently, one per limb allowed must be six ounces or less. Physical soaring, trimming down a sensitive sole or removing supportive hoof wall, inducing laminitis, adding weight to pads or inserting hard objects between pads and sole, over tightening the bands that actually hold the packages on. From a legal standpoint, 1970 the Horse Protection Act was passed and then again amended in 1976. Um, basically saying it's illegal to soar, they set fines, and soaring is not allowed in shows. Then they set up the Designated Qualified Persons Program, which is over, uh, oversaw by the uh, USDA, and DQPs, as we call them, are licensed by horse industry organizations. We look at uh, some more history. 2006, swabbing begins, and this is done by the DQPs and mostly by uh, those veterinarians that are do uh, doing the inspections from USDA. Um, in 2008, AP came out with a white paper uh, putting the horse first again, focusing on ending of soaring of these horses. Uh, 2010, USDA uh, had a report uh, on the oversight uh, of the Horse Protection Act was inadequate. Um, this was done by the uh, Attorney General's office. 
um, and mostly it faults the DQP program uh, because it's self-policing. Uh, one day you could be a judge at a show, and then the next day you're working for an HIO as a DQP, and you're inspecting the next show. Uh, there's some flaw in that design. Um, and then in 2012, it became much more public, um, escalated public concerns, uh, bigger fines, criminal indictment of the trainer. So the current situation, a sword gate is still rewarded in those shows, uh, but you can you saw in those numbers earlier, there's less people and there's probably less shows taking place. Um, eight to nine percent of all horses in 2011 and 2012 were cited at their largest event, which is uh, the Walking Horse Celebration in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Um, the industry, of course, has failed to police itself. Uh, they do not cooperate with USDA and their enforcement. Uh, and there's strong efforts across the board uh, from the industry and veterinary groups uh, and the community to stop it. So last, well, 2013, for the last Congress, uh, we worked with a variety of groups, including uh, some of the uh, humane and activist organizations, uh, to develop the Prevent All Soaring Tactics Act. Um, this would amend the Horse Protection Act to ban performance packages. It would ban the action devices. And rules would only apply to Tennessee walking horses, spotted saddle horses, and racking horses. Um, just to update you on that bill and some of the others, uh, the Prevent All Soaring Tactics Act uh, did not get passed. Uh, we had more co-sponsors on both the House side and Senate side than many, or most, I should say, of the bills in Congress. Um, but again, because of a few senators in Kentucky and Tennessee who held their thumb on this legislation, um, it did not come forward. They even introduced their own legislation, which garnered no more than 12 co-sponsors on the House side and four on the Senate side. Um, we are currently working as an industry to uh, launch uh, or reintroduce uh, the PAST Act for this new Congress, and we're hopeful that that will be uh, announced fairly soon. Dr. Aguinor. <clears throat> I went to a horse council, Colorado Horse Council meeting, uh, and there was a lady from Cal which is out of Missouri, right? Uh, Kansas City. And they were against this act. Why were, do you remember what, and, and it seemed like to me, I went up and talked to her afterwards, but it was kind of one of those things, I think, where they thought that they were passing the bill to tell us what to do in, in our industry, you know, type thing. And, I mean, the lady was really sharp, really bright, uh, didn't agree with soaring, but lobbied against this thing. And, and, and for me, it was just uh, un unbelievable. And, yeah. and that's all I could think of. We got to get people like that on our side. You know, and not be out there lobbying. Well, that, I mean, that's a good point. There are concerns that um, when USDA sends inspectors out that they are a little zealous in their activities um, of the inspection. Um, they use words such as uh, it's not, uh, it's objective, it's not scientific in their process. And they're looking for, you know, uh, more scientific processes. We can disagree. Um, on that all day with a lot of these individuals. Um, you know, the difficulty is this has been going on 40 years. There is legislation. We've spent $20 million of our money, um, you know, each, well, not each year, but over that time period, um, because they only have about uh, $600,000 a year, USDA has, to actually manage this program, which, you know, is nothing, which makes it difficult to manage it correctly. Um, so this is an industry that basically is putting itself, you know, to death.
per se. Um, and those numbers show it. You know, they've lost sponsors, it shows. They're losing individuals. <laughs> the other difficult part is it's affecting other industries, such as saddlebreds and, and others that are related, because the general public doesn't know the difference. They're like, oh, my gosh, you guys are, you know, soaring these horses. Well, no, they're not. Now, they may have other issues, but this isn't the issue, and that's not what the Horse Protection Act is driven uh, as an enforcement effort. But you're exactly right. There are concerns that Big Brother government is out there coming in to tell us what to do. This is already on the books. We're just trying to improve it to where something we're already paying for, they can do a better job at it. Um, real quickly, Veterinary Medicine Mobility Act. Um, this was uh, introduced, this was an issue uh, past couple years uh, regarding the use of controlled substances and veterinarians carrying their controlled substances in their vehicles. Um, we were fortunately able to show reason to Congress um, on something and they actually passed this legislation. Um, so that was good news on the legislative front. Uh, Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act of 2013. This has not been reintroduced. Basically, this is addressing uh, medication, and the goal, the main goal of this uh, legislation was to have um, uh, another agency um, do the testing and to get rid of Lasix as uh, and phase out Lasix as a performance enhancing uh, medicine. Um, so no word if that will be reintroduced or not. I anticipate, like with most things, these bills are introduced during a high public uh, media attention time, such as the Kentucky Derby or something else. They time their announcement of these bills around uh, media. Um, real quickly, I know we're running close on time. Uh, I didn't think I'd go all this long, but thank you, Dr. Lenz. Um, Looking at uh, some of the quarter horse issues, uh, show ring ethics and un unacceptable training uh, techniques, a uh, couple years back the AQHA formed a welfare commission. Um, it's not just uh, AQHA members. I know Dr. Lenz serves on the commission, I believe, and a variety of others. Um, but it's to look at all aspects uh, of the quarter horse, uh, especially on the show side, uh, definition of abuse, ex any excessive or repetitive action causing obvious uh, distress or discomfort, uh, structure and fines, penalties, and ways to address the abuse and unsportsmanlike conduct. Um, they've also instituted a number of uh, fines and penalties. Um, here you can see the different levels uh, from mild to severe. And Dr. Lynn said just uh, last week they actually increased uh, some of these numbers. Anything else on that, Tom? Yeah, uh, they doubled it up. I mean, what it's saying that is the QHA's always had stewards in the ring, but most of the abuse takes place in the stalls and in the warm up tents. And so now they have stewards that wander through the stalls. And we're looking for horses that are fitted up 24 hours a day, or their heads tied around, or their heads tied up, or pulled down, or uh, people in the warm-up pen, you know, rangers, they like to run their horse at a wall to teach them to stop. They want them to slide, they want them to stop. And so that's illegal, and some of those things. So we've up the top fines to $25,000 to permanent Permanently kicked out of AQHA and doubled some of the other fines. And so there's a real concerted effort to stop this kind of activity. Great, thank you. And then just real quickly looking at uh, some of the detrimental genetic diseases. Um, you know, we were talking at breakfast this morning that uh, some of these breeds actually uh, breed towards uh, the disease because it's a favorable characteristic uh, of, of a certain type of uh, discipline or a certain type of um, uh, halter horse look or something. So just wanted to uh, mention some of these. So as I finish up here, here's just a quick look at some of the uh, owner demographics. We look at uh, the proportion of horse owners, 18 to 34, has declined 15% 
from 2009 to 2013. You're looking at uh, 11% of 18 to 34, 42% uh, 35 to 54, and 55 years plus at 47%. And this comes from the Brackey study. But I think this is pretty close. And Dr. Lenz will be talking about some of the ways or as an industry we're looking to address this in the future. Um, so declining ownership, declining youth participation. So how do we get new owners involved in our business? <laughs>